Hi, I'm Judy Cudlow and welcome to the Harlem Studio of Art. We are in what's called East Harlem or Spanish Harlem and you can probably hear it's a very rainy day today in Spanish Harlem and uh, I paint here and I teach here. In the 19th century it was called naturalism, meaning that uh, we paint what we see in a way that represents what it is in a natural way. Um, I think it was also in the 19th century just called art because that's what art was. Now art's a lot of different things. So we have settled on this term classical realism to try to differentiate it from expressionism and impressionism and all these other things. Now sight size comes into the training in a really important way because as I said, it's all about getting accuracy in drawing. And um, some people that I've taught to do this <laughs> are so surprised by the simplicity of it. They actually think they're cheating. <laughs> they think, oh, that's too easy. You know, um, it is, it is easy. So I have set up this kind of simple classical still life to show you the steps I use to make a painting. The first step is a very careful drawing. Second step is a color study. And the third step is the painting, which I also do in steps, which I call passes. The first pass is sort of a general massing in of basic shapes and colors. Then there's a second uh, pass, which is working the transitions from the darks to the lights, putting in some details, refining contours, putting in highlights and accents. And that is pretty much the steps that are involved in the painting. Now, the other thing that I want you to take away from this demonstration today is the use of the sight size method for painting and drawing. Now, sight size simply involves positioning myself and my easel in such a way that I can paint my subject in exactly the size that it appears in my sight. And that's why it's called sight size. All right, now remember I said that we, we have a step-by-step -step approach and this is the first step, this is the drawing part. Now I draw on tracing paper usually because I even, even though I do an accurate drawing, I like to be able to have the uh, possibility of repositioning or cropping when I transfer my drawing to my canvas so I can still make a few compositional decisions at that point. Um, you'll notice I've drawn an outline here. This is the size of my canvas. And the most important line here is this line on the right. So, my tools. I use a very sharp piece of vine charcoal, a plumb line, this is just a heavy piece of thread attached to a fishing weight, and a kneaded eraser. Now, All of my measurements are going to be taken from this spot and I'm going to illustrate plotting a few points. That's how we make a drawing. We plot points that look kind of like a, a constellation and then we connect them all with dots, uh, with the straight lines. So I'm going to start by locating the top of the spout. Okay. Now I stretch my plumb line across my setup over to my drawing board and I hold it steady and level and I locate the very high spot of that spout. I memorize that spot. I come up here and I mark it. Now you can see I spend quite a bit of time at this stage because once I've done this I don't have to think about this again. I'm, I'm testing it with my palette knife and I can get a pretty good idea of whether or not it's the right color but I won't actually know until I put it on my canvas. So this is just the first step. I'm going to mix up all the colors 
and get them as close as I can get to, to how they look with the pellet knife held up to them. But then the next phase is going to be taking a paintbrush and actually applying it to my canvas. And it, we, it will look slightly different on the canvas because the canvas um, is light and it, it, uh, the paint will be put on thin. So all these things affect the, uh, mostly the value of the paint. So I won't really know if I have the right colors until I start putting it on the, on the canvas, which I'll do after I've finished mixing all my colors. So I have my background and now I'll mix up some of the green of the apple. So I mentioned that I have my, my sort of standard permanent green mixture here and I, I need some room for the, my apples because I know I'm going to have several colors so I start over here. Now that's way too chromatic. So we're going to take some brown pull down that chroma a little bit. And that gets me pretty close to the mid value of the apple, but since I like to work on my palette from dark to light, left to right, I'm going to darken that some more so that I have my darkest dark of my apple. It's not going to look real in that sense of naturalism because what's missing after the first pass and should be missing is that this should have a really flat graphic look to it. Um, Cezanne would be perfectly happy with the first pass because that's how he painted. He liked it that way. Um, and that's fine. It's a, it's a certain look and a lot of people paint that way. Um, I'm going for naturalism, and so I want my objects to turn. I want them to be three-dimensional. I want that illusion, and we don't have that in the first pass. That comes in the second pass, and, and what creates that illusion of form, of three dimension, is the transitions between the darks and the lights. When you have it painted the way it is right now, with very distinct uh, trend, they're not transitions, distinct passages of light and dark, um, it flattens it. And that's exactly what I want for this stage of the painting. Right now it's really about color and value because I know the drawing's right, so I'm not even really looking at that. Um, I'm happy if the colors that I mixed and applied in the color study seem to be holding up um, on this canvas as the, as the right choice.